so bismillah rahman rahim assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh welcome everybody for this very unique session uh, about glaucoma we are uh, together on the glaucoma platform with you all to learn from our professor uh, ahmed mustafa from egypt he is a great professor a great teacher and he always takes care of young ophthalmologists like me so uh, i'm very happy <laughs> today to moderate the session with him <laughs> and um, today uh, we are going to learn from him the tube shunt surgery and by the way uh, the next wednesday he will be as well the speaker uh, as a continuation to this subject but the complications of the shunts so um, this lecture can uh, be considered as two parts Part number one, number one today, the uh, tube shunt uh, surgery, and next Wednesday, the complications. Uh, the platform is yours, uh, Professor Ahmed, and we are all yours. Uh, Dr. Mazin, thank you very much. Uh, it's definitely my great pleasure to be with you. Uh, I always feel uh, I have special feelings towards the activities um, uh, you are creating. Uh, and one of uh, this is the uh, uh, Glaucoma uh, Sinjab Academy or Sinjab uh, Glaucoma Academy. So it seems away from the refractive uh, field, uh, but, uh, you have the ability to contribute to any of the uh, ophthalmic fields actually. Uh, so thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, and I hope that the lecture will be uh, of help, uh, inshallah, to all of us. Um, Yes, and now my talk will be on the glaucoma drainage uh, devices, uh, which is not an easy topic to cover. So I will try to cover in two parts, as you have mentioned, the part one, uh, that, that's the basics, and part two, uh, some complex cases and uh, complications, which I think is an integral part of the work. Now, uh, this was my patient uh, 25 uh, years ago. And you can see the very ugly valve. This was a valve and it's a very insisted valve and uh, it's very near to the limbus, as you can see. Uh, and also you can see uh, the cornea is uh, opaque. Otherwise I wouldn't have uh, put this tube uh, in the cornea. So it seems that the tube has created some problems uh, in the cornea. So this was uh, 25 years ago and that was the appearance, which is definitely cosmetically very unacceptable as well. And for that reason, I thought that um, the valves are behind a lot of uh, complications that could happen in the future. And I, I was so much restricted in the use of the glaucoma drainage devices. Uh, and when I face a case of a secondary glaucoma or uh, some a, a refractory case of glaucoma, I was so much inclined towards cycloablation that definitely uh, pushed my abilities too much in the area of cycloablation. And I used to do a kind of comparison, which is a bit uh, towards the cycloablation, like the cycloablation is more titratable and then it's applied for our eyes and then the corneal endothelium. We know that the valves could reduce the corneal endothelium. And then the subsequent procedures after the valves could be multiple, could be few after the cycloablation. And again, cost effectiveness, you can think that the valves are definitely more expensive. The, um, the cycloablative procedures are more uh, repeatable. The technique is uh, rapid and it's an outpatient procedure, extraocular few minutes. So again, I tried to put everything in favor of the uh, cycloablation, as you can see, to be away from the valves as much as possible. I did stop practicing valves, but I know that I can have lots of complications following valves implantations. And also I published in the um, Egyptian Journal of Ophthalmology together with my colleague, Dr. Hal al Hilali, at that time, uh, that the complications of Ahmed valve, we were applied, uh, we applied the valves mainly on the pediatric age group and some others, and definitely we reported a lot of uh, complications. So that's why uh, I was away from the uh, valves. So what happened recently? A few years ago, I started to feel uh, a desperate need for uh, the valves uh, as I'm facing kind of cases which need um, 
which are suitable for valve implantation. And also I have uh, seen that, yes, cycloablative procedures are quite good, but uh, you might need a lot of uh, repeat and then uh, a lot of debates in case you have uh, an eye with very good visual acuity. So I, I felt a need for uh, improving my abilities in the uh, valve procedure. Uh, besides that, in the era of COVID, we had the opportunity to communicate and to meet uh, lots of my friends uh, virtually. And some of those were really giants in the field of uh, valve surgery. They motivated me more and more to resume uh, this part of my career. So I started to go uh, uh, extensively into the area of the valves uh, once more, like a few years ago, and now gaining more experience and harvesting uh, better outcomes, as uh, I'll mention later. The general principle of a valve, that uh, the valves are generally developed for the treatment of the complex cases of uh, glaucomas. Uh, any valve, uh, there is a plate and a tube. Uh, the tube is inserted inside the eye and it should take the equus from the anterior chamber to the surface of the plate that is secure to the sclera. Now around the plate, there is initially a blip and this blip will have a fibrovascular coat. So it will form a capsule, a fibrovascular capsule. Now the wall of this capsule will control to a great extent the flow of the equus from the capsule to the surrounding space. So that again, this periplate fibrous capsule will play a role in the control of the intraocular pressure. So if there is a good flow or communication between this bleb or this capsule and the surrounding space, now the pressure will be fine. If, the, if this capsule is applying too much pressure and doesn't allow the equus to go outside of it, now the pressure will go up, we will face troubles. So a lot of work, nowadays and years ago, how to control the permeability of this periplate fibrous capsule. This periplate fibrous capsule is formed around four to six weeks. And that's why this area, this period of the management is very important because something is happening around the plate. The available implants uh, nowadays in the market worldwide, we have the valve implants and they have a kind of valve, two membranes, uh, they apply a kind of resistance to the flow of the equus so that once you put the tube inside the eye, the equus um, will go out. But if the pressure goes down below 10 or 8, uh, the, those membranes will collapse so that no more equus will go out. So uh, it looks like an advantage in the valve implants. And on top comes the Ahmed glaucoma valve. And the Ahmed glaucoma valve, the common one we are using, the flexible plate 7. I think my colleagues are using this one with the surface area of 184 square millimeter and it's a form of silicone. So it is soft. Uh, the implantation and manipulation of this is relatively soft. Uh, there are different types, but this one is in common use. Now, when it comes to the non-valve implants, and why do we have non-valve implants? Because non-valve implants, now the equus will go uh, outside, outside the eye through the tube. If you do not apply any kind of um, a restriction to the flow, the pressure will go down and you will get into hypotony. That's why those types of implants, you need to do something to prevent the flow or to decrease it, like to ligate like the tube, like to put a suture inside the tube. You don't want to uh, pass into hypotony. And the idea of that, it is just you will go a period where the periplate fibrous capsule will form and then the equus will go easily through the tube. So you, you will get the tube with some absorbable sutures. On top of the non-valved implants comes the barbell. And we have the barbell two sizes, the small one, 250 and 350 millimeter square, which is more commonly used at the 350 square millimeter. And then uh, the company of uh, Ahmed Valve, they have produced the clear path, which is uh, a product uh, or it's an Ahmed Valve, but without, uh, without a valve. So it's a valveless, like a valveless Ahmed uh, valve. And it's now getting into the market, uh, clear path, uh, and a lot of surgeons are using it. And it comes in two sizes, 250 and 350. And then also Moltino nowadays is trying to come back. Moltino was the initial good um, implant, but that was in 1986. And then Moltino is coming back with the Moltino 3 design. 
um, which is uh, again one of the mostly non valved implants and it's available now in the market. And this is the clear pack, which is the product of the uh, New World Medical. And these are the two uh, sizes and it comes actually with the suture with the 4O proline uh, suture that occludes the uh, tube uh, temporarily. And then this is the Montino tube. Again, it's, uh, it's uh, trying to come back to the market. Uh, now to the left here is the uh, uh, barbell implants or the, there is an Indian version, which is the Orolap, which is like the barbell implant. It's, it's a, a large implant which has to go underneath the muscles so that it's a bit uh, uh, more difficult for its insertion. And um, to the uh, right side, uh, we'll see the Ahmed glaucoma valve that we will see later. Uh, now to the left, that's uh, it's my pleasure to have this photo with uh, Dr. Moltino. Uh, Dr. Moltino passed away, but uh, I, this, uh, this picture, I had the pleasure to have uh, this pic during one of the meetings. And Dr. Ahmed Mateen, the inventor of the Ahmed glaucoma uh, valve. Then um, the question is when to implant? Um, uh, implants are basically introduced as a second procedure. It means that you have performed your initial surgery, like trabeculectomy, and then um, the trabeculectomy have failed, and then you can see a lot of scarring. You will move to another step, and then you will go for that. So it's usually a second procedure, and it was introduced basically as a second procedure. But nowadays, there is a growing interest in being a primary procedure, in cases where the trabeculectomy is expected to have a low success rate. Like when you deal with new vascular glaucoma, uveitic glaucoma, and some cases of developmental and juvenile glaucomas. And nowadays, there is a growing interest uh, to consider it a primary procedure for uncontrolled primary open angle glaucoma. And when it comes to the states, quite interesting, there is a decline in the uh, performance of TRAP and there is increase in the uh, performance of uh, valves. So there is a, a, a generalized interest in the use of valves with growing experience in this uh, area and the management of the uh, complications and bad outcomes. Other indications, you know, traumatic affected pseudophagic glaucomas, post keratoplasty, uh, so that again, most of the difficult cases of glaucomas uh, could be managed with the valves. So that was uh, like the uh, the management options for primary open angle glaucoma, and you can see the valves come uh, at the end of the list when everything is done. But nowadays there is a trial of push to get it more. Uh, and with, the, uh, with increasing in the experience of the surgeons, they are using it as a primary procedure in patients with advanced primary open angle glaucoma. When I plan my patient for a valve, usually I, I put my patient on the slate lamp and I have a look on the superior conjunctiva. This is very, very important because some patients under the influence of the anti-glaucoma medications and senility, they get the conjunctiva very atrophic. They get the conjunctiva very adherent to the x -clear. Now in those patients, it doesn't seem logic that I'll go for implantation of the valve. There is no room for the valve so that I do that intentionally. I test the mobility of the conjunctiva so that I know in advance, I don't want to go to the OR and then I find the conjunctiva plastered on the sclera and then I have to change my procedure. So again, I test the conjunctiva. Then I have a look on the iris because patients with the uh, secondary glaucomas like the new vascular glaucoma, sometimes we do inject with the, uh, the procedure of the valve. We apply the valve and we inject um, anti vegifs so if we have NDIs, we inject at the same time. We look at the anterior chamber depth. If the AC is shallow, we do not put a tube unless you do cataract surgery at the same time, because you cannot leave the tube very near to the cornea, otherwise the cornea will suffer. Gonioscopy is an integral part of all uh, glaucoma uh, examination procedures. You can find if you uh, plan to put the tube uh, up and temporal, then you need to check there no peripheral anti something here that the tube will face uh, in front uh, at the time of introduction. The state of the lens is very important. If the patient is having cataract, then you are planning for a combined phaco and cataract. And then a patient, pseudophotic patient, and, th and those patients are so many. Um, and then uh, those patients, you can place the tube uh, in the sulcus, you know that. You can place the tube in the sulcus. 
And in patients uh, after vitrectomy or affected patients, still there is a place for uh, parzaplana implantation. Now in the OR, when you see the patient with uh, this picture, so much adherent conjunctiva, there is no way to go for a valve, whatever dissection you will do so that I just make it a uh, shortcut and I go for diode. Again here, there is no conjunctiva. The conjunctiva, this is so obvious, but some patients, you will, you will discover this on the operating table. So it's better to know in advance. If the conjunctiva is very adherent, I'll go to my beloved cycloablative procedures. There is no way to dissect a conjunctiva that's very adherent to the sclera. Regarding the anesthesia, definitely the surgeon has to be comfortable. This is very important. And also uh, the patient, patients who, uh, who are very young, definitely general anesthesia might be good for them. Uh, uh, but adult patients still, the peribulbar and retrobulbar block are very good for those uh, patients. Uh, at the time of the surgery, these are uh, some surgical uh, tips. I need to open the conjunctiva. I, I open a large incision of the conjunctiva extending from the superior rectus to the lateral rectus. If I'm going to operate on the upper temporal quadrant in the majority of the situations, and I usually adjust my microscope so that I'm facing this quadrant so that this will make the work easier uh, for me. Uh, sometimes when the orbit is tight and the exposure is difficult, you can use a superior rectus traction suture. Uh, this will facilitate the exposure. So the most important item while putting an implant, you need a good exposure. You cannot place the implant in an area where there's a lot of uh, fib uh, fibrous tissue or the implant is not resting easily. You cannot do that. The implant will migrate anteriorly. And alternatively, we can place a corneal traction suture, which I'm, I think um, most of my colleagues and myself are doing this nowadays. Corneal traction suture applied to the superior cornea, sometimes to the inferior cornea. But anyway, I think this is the one used nowadays, 7O Vicryl on a spatulated needle. And you can see the marks because before the operation, I do the marks. And why do I do that? Because sometimes the eye rotates and then you are confused where is the lateral rectus from the inferior rectus? And believe me, that could happen. So that I make it easier for me that while I'm at the 12 o'clock position, I do markings of the lateral rectus and the superior rectus. And then I put like the place of the tube, which is supposed uh, to be here. This is not definite, but again, it is just um, expectation. And then I do measurements. I like to have the whole area clear like that. And it is centered between the uh, lateral rectus and superior rectus here, and then this distance, I go for 12 millimeter. What's written in the books, and what I used to do is to uh, put the implant an eight to 10 millimeter, so that the implant is usually visible. Nowadays, I switched my technique to move the implant posterior, and I'm so happy with that uh, step. Though it is technically difficult, but I think the benefit of this procedure is uh, quite good, and it has been internationally accepted uh, step. So that I may, I do initial measurement like 12 millimeter, and then I divide this 12 millimeter into three millimeter parts. So three millimeter, three millimeter, three millimeter, and three millimeter, four parts of uh, three millimeters. And then I create uh, scleral uh, incisions using the crescent. Uh, the crescent is a very helpful uh, dissector for the sclera, but uh, just beware if the crescent is very sharp because um, it can cut through the sclera. And as I'll show you uh, next week, uh, inshallah. And then I divide this area again into three millimeter areas. And then I start dissecting tunnels. When I dissect the tunnel, I use the crescent blade and I make it uh, on the surface of the sclera. I, do, I don't use it like perpendicular. That is just, it, the foot is resting on the sclera. So I'm applying pressure on the sclera while dissecting the implant. And I need a second instrument as a counter pressure. So that it's a bimanual technique because if you dissect with the, the tunnel with the crescent, sometimes it keeps dissecting and it doesn't come out. You want to, uh, to make the tunnel um, three millimeter as I'm planning so that I use the second instrument to depress the sclera. While depressing the sclera, this will help the, uh, the um, crescent to come out. And again, now the crescent has come. 
and then I dissected the rest of the tendons. And then the third part is a flap. I dissect a flap like that after a bicolectomy. And definitely I'm just uh, presenting what I'm doing. And I know there are hundreds of modifications and definitely um, I'm having experts with, with me, Dr. Ali, Dr. Hassan, uh, Dr. Mazin, and lots of glaucoma surgeons. They are having their own tricks, but I'm just showing what uh, I'm doing uh, in, in reality. And then the sclera flap, it's better to be a thick flap. It's different from the deep sclerotic, which is a thin flap. I like to go for a thick uh, sclera flap. So uh, now the uh, before I proceed forward, then I, I put the sutures of the implant. So it's a, like pre-placed sutures. So sometimes we put the implant and then we go for the scleral sutures of the implant. But I'm working posterior, like 12 millimeter, which is not easy. It needs a, a bit of training for me and for the assisting nurse as well, for the scrub nurse. So um, I used uh, nowadays to place the sutures before I proceed, and then I put it the, the other suture, and then there is a loop which I cut, and then we have two sutures. So the, I do that before putting the implant. This facilitated things for me. Then I do priming, as you know, by injection through the, uh, the valve. We do not inject vigorously. You can damage the membranes gently. We, once you see the fluid coming, uh, and that's enough. And then uh, the, the implant should go smoothly. And one of, the, uh, one of the tips here that I use the artery forceps to separate the tenons layer so that I don't use scissors because scissors sometimes they can damage the tissues. The, uh, the artery, especially the artery which is curved so that it has a curve on the sclera and then I open and then it will help the separation of the tenons effectively. And the good point is that the implant will go smoothly. And then this is here, the pre-placed sutures I place so that I put the sutures on the implant while I see everything before I'm working posterior. Definitely um, that, that was not my technique earlier. I used to put the implant and switch. And then after I fix the, uh, the implant posteriorly, uh, I uh, hold the tube and then I go through the tunnels so from one tunnel to the second to the third tunnel. So we have three tunnels. So it looks like a long tunnel, but I cannot dissect a, a tunnel that is uh, nine millimeter with the crescent. That's very dangerous. So that I'm just dividing and that, uh, those spaces sometimes disappear completely. So it seems like one uh, tunnel, like here, so that uh, it looks like a, a tunnel. Now, uh, while doing that, the remaining part of the tube is short because in the old days when I put the, the implant like eight millimeter, uh, the tube is around 20 millimeters. So I find a long part of the tube to cut. But I, once I place the implant, the, the plate now posterior, the remaining part of the tube is usually not uh, too long. I make it beveled and then we, uh, we pierce the limbus using the 23 gauge needle. We can have this needle connected to helon. So that once you inject, you inject helon, that helon will fill the anterior chamber and will lubricate the entry site. Uh, alternatively, you can make a paracentesis and I inject helon. So at the time of the implantation, I don't want to lose the anterior chamber. Either I inject helon in this area in particular to make it deep at the time of insertion of the tube, or I just take the needle on a helon. And that could be enough length. It is 2.5 to 3 millimeter. And I used uh, like to measure the distance as half the distance uh, from the limbus to the pupil. Uh, this one is a slightly longer, but I'll be satisfied when it is half the distance on the surface of the eyes. So again, this is the video. Uh, so the dissecting the conjunctiva, it was a recurrent uh, pediatric glaucoma or juvenile uh, glaucoma. So you can see a lot of tenons. Uh, and then again, the artery forceps will help the separation. And in this case, uh, I, uh, I just wanted to have good exposure by uh, hooking the muscle, but I do this very, very infrequently. I use the corneal traction suture. Now I like to see the sclera and then I do diathermy as uh, needed. And the, I retract the tissues and then I measure 12 millimeters. Now, once the exposure is like that, I really feel happy. And I feel that uh, I'm comfortable with the tunnels and the suturing. Then I'm dividing uh, into three uh, millimeter tunnels, uh, uh, as all of you uh, see, uh, just a landmark. And then I'm going to use the crescent. And again, I try to use the crescent gently because if the crescent is very sharp, it can go inside the eye. So I dissect the, uh, the 
those incisions. And then uh, sometimes we can find remnants of episcleral tissues. You can uh, take the, uh, those away with the, with the uh, knife. And then uh, after I did my incisions, again, uh, dissecting the posterior tunnel, uh, I found it easier to have the direction of the crescent from uh, proximal to distal, so that from the cornea backwards. Uh, this is a much more convenient. Uh, yes, you can do from backward uh, forwards, but again, I found this one is uh, convenient for me. And I'm again, I'm sitting again in the upper temporal quadrant, and then going to the last part, it is a flap or a trap door. Uh, I know that some of the surgeons are just piercing uh, the limbus and putting graft uh, on this. Uh, again, hundreds of techniques are available, but I dissect the flap and then every now and then I make the field dry and then I'm putting the non-absorbable sutures. Yes, I see that, I know again, there are some schools which are using absorbable uh, sutures and there are some schools which are not using sutures at all. But again, I'm using uh, non-absorbable sutures because the implant can uh, migrate. Uh, and then uh, passing the, th this is uh, uh, non-absorbable, uh, AT bond uh, 5O. You can use uh, nylon. Uh, eight o or nine o as well, and then holding the tube. It's very important. If the tube is long, you will not be able to hold it. So take a short part of the tube and make it very beveled, and then you can uh, move it uh, through the tunnel. And then once you get it, you will push it into the second tunnel. So it, it's uh, again just connected. They are all connected together. And then once uh, you have this appearance, then you will cut the extra length of the tube. Again, the remaining part of the tube is relatively uh, small. You make it beveled and beveling is towards the cornea. If it is toward the iris, the iris can occlude it. Again, this is the moment of the uh, piercing the anterior chamber. The needle will go parallel to the iris or even slightly towards the iris, but not towards the cornea. And it is the direction of the needle that will control the, the orientation of the tube inside the anterior chamber. You don't want it to be directed towards the cornea. So again, the eye is filled with helium at that time. I don't want to lose the anterior chamber. And I'm satisfied with this length. It's a, it's a um, um, congenital glaucoma, you see a recurrent. And I apply two sutures. Now, if the tissues are very thin here, I'll put a scleral patch graft. If the tissues are good, so that now I'm satisfied and I will not do anything. And sometimes it is even the implant is greater than uh, 12 uh, millimeter. Now, again, it is just a uh, revision of the technique, again, that is starting with the posterior uh, incision, uh, posterior tunnel, and then moving it to the uh, middle tunnel. Again, that everything is connected. And with time, I found this, it is uh, reproducible, so that it is not difficult to reproduce once you train. And I trained myself on that. And uh, as you see, um, this uh, technique awarded the second place from the American Academy of Thermology in the global uh, video contest the, uh, uh, this year. So again, this is the, the, the last part. Again, it's a flap. I know that you can do a tunnel, but with tunnel in my hands, it was not easy to implant the tube uh, through the tunnel so that I decided to make it like even a trap door so that you can cut one edge or you can uh, make it like flap. So again, you can just gently push the tube. It will come because the tube is beveled and then you will immediately uh, move it. And sometimes you can take it without getting it uh, out of the uh, uh, every tunnel, a single pass uh, that everything will, uh, you will a single pass. Okay. And then putting the, the non-absorbable suture for the plate which again, um, I'm insisting on the non-absorbable suture. I feel so much secure. And in this case, it was uh, pseudopecic, so the tube was in the sulcus. As you see, you can put it behind the iris if you insert the tube two millimeter. And then with this technique, when you move posterior, you can see a huge bleb in the upper temporal quadrant. And this is usually linked to a very good control of the intraocular pressure. This is the appearance of the tube like one year after the operation um, so that the tube is not, uh, is not very well seen, but sometimes a shadow of the tube is seen and this operation like one and a half year ago, I really don't know, but uh, uh, this 
could be further improved if you dissect the sclera deeper so that with experience you can handle the sclera to have the tunnels uh, deep and you have the flap uh, deep as well. Uh, so um, in the old days, I used to push the valve and then put the scleral suture. Definitely, this is not easy. When you ask the scrub nurse all the time, push the valve posterior and then uh, try to, uh, to find the space for the suture. That's why the pre-placed sutures before putting the implant facilitated actually uh, my life. Sometimes I close the tenons separately. Uh, when I have a thick ten a tenon, I make use of it. I dissect it from the conjunctiva and I secure a separate layer of tenon on the uh, valve. When the conjunctiva in the perilumbal area is a scar, and that could happen, you know, well, after a failed surgery, and then uh, because the valves are usually next to the field operation, so that I, I know the posterior conjunctiva is good, but the anterior conjunctiva is not. So that I'm injecting um, a BSS deep to the uh, conjunctiva, trying to form uh, space. And I know that I want to dissect, look a lot of, it looks like a, a line of a scarring, so that I'm trying to push the, the subconjunctival fluid and subtenons fluid mechanically to try to get more and to create more of the subconjunctival space. I'm using the hook as well uh, to try to get more of the conjunctiva anterior because I don't want to cut the conjunctiva so much away from the uh, limbus. So again, I thought now I'm a bit relatively in a better position. And then when I cut at that time, I, I make sure that I'm cutting towards the cornea. So again, uh, to harvest as much as possible of the conjunct. The conjunctiva itself is not bad, but the perilumbal conjunctiva is so much scarred. So again, I'm making use of, the, um, of this uh, pushing effect to uh, have more space. And you know, at the conclusion of the surgery, it was easy to get this conjunctiva uh, towards the limbus. So again, conjunctival hydrodissection, sometimes I do it. When I'm not uh, so much uh, comfortable with the scleral flap, I put uh, a scleral patch graft uh, and I cover uh, this area. Now uh, the patient uh, underwent is having um, cataract as well. And then um, again, after placing the uh, valve as usual, and then what, uh, this is the tip, the tip here that I, I'll, I'm going to take this tube and place it inside the tunnel. You know that you cannot operate cataract while the tube uh, is uh, in the view. It will disturb you and just take it back and uh, just uh, put it inside the second tunnel like that. And then uh, I rotate the eye to do a cataract surgery without the tube uh, obstructing my view. And uh, uh, now this is the, con the conclusion of the cataract surgery with, with the lens uh, implantation. And that was the site of previous scarring from the previous uh, glaucoma surgery. Now the, the, the lens is placed uh, in the bag and afterwards uh, I'll move to uh, insert the tube. Um, um, so that with, uh, when we have cataract, so simultaneous cataract and glaucoma surgery, you can implant the tube behind the iris, make use of this two millimeter behind the limbus. You go parallel to the iris and then you move and you will have the needle coming between the iris and the capsule. So, and I inject helon in this area just to inflate this space and push the iris anterior to create a space for the tube to move because uh, sometimes uh, the, 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 yes, the needle will pass in front of the IOL, but when you put the tube, it can move behind the IOL. Again, the tube is coming uh, in the area where uh, I love to see uh, and we need to see the tip of the tube. I don't leave the tube behind the iris and it's not seen so that it could be occluded by the iris. Uh, so again, I, I touch it uh, with the Senesky, why? Because sometimes you are confused whether the tube is in front of the IOL or behind the IOL, just I want to make sure by touching this and then I remove the viscoelastic. So this is my technique. Definitely, when the AC is deep after the cataract surgery, you still can put the tube on the iris, but you have the, adva the advantage here of placing the tube behind the iris, but make sure that you see the tube all, all the time. So this is again, two millimeter behind the limbus and you go parallel. So again, when you insert the first tube, you go parallel to the iris and sometimes towards the iris. When you insert behind the iris, you go parallel, parallel but two millimeter behind uh, the limbus and then you will get into this uh, space. I inject a lot of viscoelastic to facilitate 
the implantation and then uh, make sure that the tube is in front of the IOL and not behind. And this, this is the tube seen post-operatively. Uh, uveated glaucoma is one of the indications, you know, for, uh, for uh, uh, surgery. And you can see the atrophic iris from the attack of uh, uveitis. Uh, again, there is a growing interest in managing uveatic, uncontrolled uveated glaucoma with implants because they think the, the implants are much more tolerant to the attacks of uveats if it, if it happens in the future so that it comes. Yes, there are some other techniques. There is an angle surgery, there is trap, but, but uh, valves, they come on the top of the list. So dissecting as usual, and this is the F-sclera here. It's, uh, it has its characteristic appearance so that I dissect, then I go with my artery, my curved artery, and then, uh, then I, I, I place it under the muscle just to create, uh, to see this area. And sometimes I mark because I know that my tube and my uh, implant will be centered here so that I divide everything as, uh, as usual, three millimeters. So that it seems like a routine procedure, but with evioitic glaucoma, uh, the most important is the integration with the, um, with the rheumatologist and with my colleagues because they give me some advice regarding the uh, perioperative preparation. Usually we give uh, steroids, um, uh, systemic steroids, and we give, uh, uh, we give uh, short-acting uh, steroids and we inject kinocort at the conclusion of the search. So again, dissecting the tunnels as usual, the technique is not different uh, from one, one eye to the other, usually the same. Uh, and uh, again, dissecting the third uh, flap, it's a flap, but I will not I, I'll do it like either a trapdoor or a flap. And here is the, again, look, uh, I'm, I'm putting the suture in the, uh, the implant before I place it. This will facilitate uh, everything, uh, especially if it is uh, pre-placed. And then it, it is a routine surgery. Again, the most important with the uveitic uh, glaucoma is not the technique, uh, but it is rather the, the, the medical management and in intraoperative and postoperative, this is one issue. And also if the patient is going to undergo simultaneous cataract surgery, there is a general recommendation that the tube is in front of the iris, not behind the iris, because uh, it, it can induce some friction with the back of the iris and activate uveitis. Again, you push it, uh, it's very important that the implant will slide smoothly, smoothly, it shouldn't come. Once you you put you push it back, it shouldn't come, shouldn't jump all the time. Otherwise, you know there is a lot of uh, resistance. Again, this is one of the surprises because everything was normal. I just dissected the sclera, but I realized there is the sclera is not very good in the upper temporal area. Definitely, just came across my mind: is that a choroidal melanoma? What what is that? And then I decided to move to another quadrant, and then I thought, no, I'll back to the same place. Um, the patient's fundus was normal. There was no evidence of anything, uh, but, but I know that this area of sclera is thinned out. Um, it's showing the, the choroid, uh, but uh, the, the, the clinical examination did not show uh, any something that's serious. Uh, and then I decided to do the, uh, like that. I, I put the implant, slightly anterior and I use the implant to support this area of the sclera. I thought if this is a weak area, so why not to uh, put the implant on this weak area? And it's okay so that uh, I manage that. And then definitely post-operative, I, I uh, made sure uh, that the patient doesn't have anything serious in uh, the eye. Now, this is a more serious situation, a patient with anterior chamber lens and everything is normal. And then the conjunctiva looks very redundant, good conjunctiva, but look, the sclera, you have surprises. So that again, when you do the valves, you can have some surprises like that. The patient preoperatively doesn't have any problem. There is no retinal detachment, there is no choroidal mass. But again, you can see something. This is um, a show of the ciliary body that pigmentation in the episclera. But again, it is very frightening appearance to see that. And you need to think, I need to take time. That's why I wipe a lot, just thinking what to do in this situation, definitely you can move to the inferior quadrant, but I don't want to do that because I can face the same situation. The patient 
we could have this picture after a buckle, for example, but the patient was not buckled. So the, I decided to make the pockets in front and behind this uh, area, and then to make the tube just crossing in front of it. And I was satisfied with this uh, management. But again, just prepare yourself that you can face something, something abnormal in the sclera, something abnormal in the muscles, as long as you will get into the valve. And here I thought of dissecting the tenons separately. It's a huge, beautiful tenon. So that I, I just sutured the tenon uh, separately. And then I sutured the uh, conjunctiva and everything went fine actually. But again, that was a surprise. And I, I'm now, after facing these two situations, I think I'm better in dealing with uh, those difficulties. Now, uh, in the upper temporal quadrant, you can see there is a staphyloma. There is an actual staphyloma. This is a visible staphyloma. Now, with this staphyloma, definitely we can't manage to put a valve that was a recurrent uh, thalamus. So that I decided now to go to the inferior quadrant. So that if we are using the upper temporal quadrant, the first priority, the next priority will be the lower nasal quadrant will be the next priority for the implantation. The other quadrants are the least to go uh, through. Uh, so again, the dissection of the inferior, uh, um, the inferior conjunctiva and the place for the valve is not difficult at all. And uh, a good indication for, uh, for the inferior placement of patients with the silicone oil, because we know patients who are having eyes feeling silicone, sometimes they have silicone coming from the back of the eye and they float up so they can occlude the tube so that it's a, it's a policy to implant the valve uh, inferiorly if you are going to do so again the dissection there was no problem and everything uh, went fine but again i'm just showing you uh, that um, we can face some difficulties that can uh, compel us to change uh, the the area of uh, implantation um, uh, so again if i notice this uh, Preoperatively, it was not very, very obvious, by the way, but under anesthesia, uh, I could see this clearly. I did not open uh, the conjunctiva over it. I just dissected the inferior. And it, was, it is the same procedure applied for, the, uh, for a superior placed one. Now, for the bophthalmic eye, you know that lots of tenons, so that expect a, a hill of work to separate the tenons, and you are confused between the tenons and the muscles. And anyway, you will take... Uh, more than time, more than usual to clear the surface of the sclera and you are left with remnants because this is a recurrent again with high uh, fibroblastic activity. Uh, I'm dissecting the sclera flap and yes, you can expect that the, the, the sclera thinned out and you might need a sclera patch graft. It's okay. You are prepared with everything in case you need it. Uh, but um, Again, there was no big problem uh, with the priming of the valve. We do not inject too much. But for the uh, both thalamic eyes, especially for the very young kids, uh, usually we leave a uh, long part of the tube. However, um, personally, I don't like to uh, implant, to put an implant on the very young kids, um, like uh, one or two years. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit uh, cautious in this age group. Um, and then uh, this is a uh, barbell, our oral lab. I, I, I'm not using it um, actually because it's very bulky. It needs a lot of uh, work uh, and the wings will go underneath the muscle. And this is one of the non valve implant. That means after you, after you fix the, the, the plate, you need to ligate the tube. You need to ligate with absorbable uh, sutures. I put two absorbable sutures until the periplate capsule is formed and then it will spontaneously uh, work. So that I'm, I'm, I'm closing uh, the, the, the tube and some surgeons are doing just um, doing a kind of um, perforation of the uh, anterior part of the tube, a kind of venting so that not the tube, uh, so not to occlude everything, a kind of anterior venting of the equus. So the tube is occluded temporarily here. But I'm not, I'm not using it. I'm not, uh, actually, uh, it's, it's so bulky so that I feel in my hands that Ahmed valve is better. So that the surgical techniques, again, if I'm going to revise, yes, double armed uh, vicryl suture on spatulated needle to help 
the exposure, uh, large conjunctival incision, be comfortable, large conjunctival incision is very important. Good exposure of the sclera, take time for the exposure and removal of the epscleral tissue. Uh, just uh, uh, make sure that all the way to the sclera is very clear. I'm using tunnels, uh, the priming, the uh, fixation with uh, non-absorbable uh, sutures. You can use uh, eight or nine or nylon. I'm using ethibon. And then um, a restriction of the flow in non-valved implants is not common actually in uh, here in Egypt, insertion of the tube. And then uh, just coming to the, the points which I think they have uh, shifted my career in this area. So that what are the secrets, which I think the secrets behind uh, my um, great interest in the valves nowadays. So that is first of all, is the posterior place, uh, placement of the plate. It is technically difficult, but I think it's very rewarding when the plate is very posterior uh, because the tenons uh, in the posterior part is very thin. Uh, I found this, the tenons very thin that could help the uh, uh, better pressure. So I think that's something good. Tunneling of the tube inside the sclera so that I don't see, nowadays I don't see a scleral uh, tube erosions or exposure. So that definitely, I don't know in the long term, like after five or 10 years what will happen, but but the, tube, the tubes are really good inside the scleral tunnels. And the intraocular part of the tube is away from the cornea. So that um, I got some cases of cornea decompensation because the direction of the tube could be towards the cornea, but nowadays I make sure it's towards the iris or at least a parallel to the iris. So I think these are some of the critical points that dramatically improved my outcome in dealing with the valves. And they moved from the area of being like I have a lot of questions around the valves uh, to a procedure which I really love and I advise, especially when there is a good indication for the valve. Now, why do I believe that posterior fixation is good? Uh, because I found this uh, article, actually I found this uh, nowadays, uh, why, why the results are better? Why I found better IOP control in my hands? Because more posterior tenons caps will very interesting, thinner and more translucent. This could be part because we cannot open the orbital fat. Don't think that if the plate moved posterior, it will go into the orbital fat, no. The, this will be a complication. We don't want that. It is still underneath the tenons and the tenons extends um, uh, down to the optic nerve so that it's still in this place, but the tenons here is thin and the tenons is the source of the periplate uh, fibrous capsule uh, encapsulation. So that I think the tenons here is anatomically more, uh, ac it's accepting more of the equus and the capsule that will form is not very hazardous capsule so that, and actually they found some smooth muscle fibers um, in the tenons layer anteriorly. They are not existing posterior. So I think there are some features in the posterior tenon that help better outcome. So that nowadays I hate those valves. So that when I just open the lid and I see the valve, I know this is the area where a lot of fibrous activity, a lot of scarring will happen around the implant. So the look at this girl, she received a bilateral implant so that you can see the right eye. The implant is very prominent. The left eye, there is nothing, but she received an implant for a, for uh, this, this uh, she's an only eyed uh, patient. This eye is an absolute eye with the implant very anterior, you see. And this one, there is an implant which is very posterior. She has very, very advanced uh, feed loss and she's so young. But again, when you see that the valve is placed very posterior, so cosmetically, even very, very acceptable to the patient. So that I, nowadays, I just tell them that the appearance usually is not very bad. Do we have to apply uh, anti-metabolites? Uh, you know, with the uh, glaucoma surgery like trap or deep scrap, we put anti-metabolites. It's a part of the operation, but for the valves, lots of debates, but the conclusion nowadays, they are not very helpful for the glaucoma drainage devices. And a lot of research is going on, but there is no uh, evidence based for the use of any kind of anti-metabolites scientifically. And then the post-operative course is usually uh, we use a co uh, antibiotics and steroids for four to six weeks. That's the time of the control of the um, the time of the periplate uh, fibrous capsule is formed, and we are expecting here for the valve implants. Uh, usually we stop. So like Ahmed valve, if the pressure is too low, 
uh, we stop. But if the pressure is going slightly up, and I'll tell you just the policy of this right now. Uh, anyway, for the non-valved implants, if you decide to put uh, Motino or uh, or uh, barbed implants, just uh, put the patient on the all anti-glaucoma medications because usually the valve doesn't work in the early post-op until the um, the suture is removed or it dissolves around the tube. Uh, just one more point on the what's known as the hypertensive phase, because one of the uh, side effects or one of the known um, complication of the valves is what's known as the hypertensive phase. We have to be aware of it and how to manage this hypertensive phase. Now, this hypertensive phase, uh, why do we get hypertensive phase? Because of the periplate uh, capsule that's forming, and at some uh, moments, at some times, it doesn't allow the echoes to go through so that the pressure here is we can get a kind of elevation of the pressure. By definition, a hypertensive phase, it's called any pressure above 21 millimeter mercury in the first three to six months. In some reports, three months or six months. In this period, if the pressure is above 21, which is the upper acceptable limit, we call this as a hypertensive phase. And it develops in a lot of patients, uh, look up to 82% of patients. And sometimes it is persistent and the pressure uh, will uh, keep uh, elevated and then we will get uh, early failure of the implant so that we need to be aware of that. Uh, the hypertensive phase is more common with the Ahmed valve uh, uh, because Ahmed valve is working from the first moment and then the equus is playing a role in the, this hypertensive uh, phase. Uh, but again, it could develop with all implants, with the bar belt, with multi with everything. And why does it happen? Why the pressure goes up? Again, a lot of the inflammatory cytokines are present in the glucometer equus because the equus uh, of the eye, where the pressure is not controlled, is different from the equus of the normal eye. A lot of inflammatory cytokines, interleukin, uh, and uh, and a lot of, uh, of of inflammatory mediators, which were inducing a lot of inflammation around the plate, and then higher preoperative IOP and high myopia have been uh, demonstrated uh, in regression analysis as a factor for the hypertensive phase, and the valved implants show greater hypertensive phase. Why? Because the valved implants from the first day they work. They allow the pressure, the, the equus to go. So the pressure will go down. This is an advantage. But at the same time, that that glaucomatous equus will help the initiation of the periplate capsule because it has a lot of inflammatory cytokines. So eventually the pressure will go up. Once this capsule is, is becoming mature, the pressure can go up. And the capsule initially is thick and then it becomes thin. As the capsule becomes thin, we can expect the pressure to go down or the pressure will go up because of cross-linking that happens in the wall of uh, this fibrous capsule. Anyway, the valved implants uh, have greater tendency to have the hypertensive phase, but at the end of the day, there is no big difference between the valve and non-valved implants in the pressure control, but there might be some, um, some greater pressure reduction with the um, non-valved implants on the long term, but again, the, different, the difference is statistically significant or not. A lot of debates in uh, this area as well. How to manage the hypertensive phase? Now you have uh, put an implant and the patient comes after two months with uh, pressure elevation. And then definitely you can feel a bit frustrated because it's a big surgery and sometimes it's a costly surgery as well. So how to manage this? Uh, a lot of debates around the role of the anti metabolites We know they don't have to do anything with the valve. Again, uh, some studies uh, suggested it may it might have to do something with this hypertensive phase. A lot, if you uh, encounter a lot of tenon, the tenon is the source of uh, this uh, capsule. So some suggested resection of the tenon, uh, intraoperative triamcinolone, uh, subtenon, uh, supratenon caps, uh, capsule implantation, some reports that to place the implant on the top of the tenon. This is technically very difficult, but also can lead to erosion of the conjunctiva. But again, thinking of this.
But what's really common in practice is to use equal suppressant so that if the pressure is greater than 10, so the pressure is low, we pres prescribe uh, the patients a combination of beta blocker and topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. And this is expected to reduce the amount of the equus going through the implant with its, um, con with its inflammatory uh, cytokines so that, and the periplate capsule is expected not to have a lot of a scarring around it, so that it reduced the uh, this um, hypertensive phase uh, to 23% versus 66% in those who are not using the, uh, the the medication. So that as a routine, I prescribe the, the patient everything, and then I put the patient on a combination of beta blocker and carbonic and raise inhibitor for three months. The only indication that I do not go through this regimen if the pressure is very low. The pressure is seven or eight so that I don't. But if the, usually I put it as a routine. The other good point is the ocular massage. We found that when you do an ocular massage, you can push the equus and that equus could have some mechanical effect on this periplate uh, fibrosis. Do, do we have to do needling? Very rarely. I, I, very rarely to manipulate the valve postoperatively. But again, if you have a seen uh, um, tenon cyst, you still can needle this cyst. You can inject some anti-metabolites uh, at the border. There is a chance for that. But again, this is not common in my practice. What, uh, what I do postoperatively, just medical uh, management uh, of the, the pressure postoperative. Uh, without doing uh, too much uh, interventions. Uh, and if the pressure eventually fails, look, this patient received two implants, and then uh, the pressure is eventually very high. Uh, what I'm going to do, just I'm going to go for a cycloablative, my beloved cycloablative procedure, can go for continuous wave or micropulse. So we have something to do. By the way, some patients believe that if you are going to do valve, this is the end of the road, you have nothing else to do. I used to tell the patient, we always have something to do, always have something to do, so that now we can move to the cycloablative procedure with a continuous wave, with a micro pulse, with an endoscopic cyclopotocoagulation, whatever, but we still have something uh, good to do to uh, my patient. Now, in conclusion, the valves are generally, there is a, a, a growing interest for the valves nowadays. Uh, what we really have is the Ahmed glaucoma valve, and I like very much um, the changes that I have introduced um, to, uh, to this area of moving the plate posterior and then doing complete tunneling of the tube and having the, the, the tube away from the cornea and have it enough length uh, inside the eye. I do expect the pressure postoperative to have a kind of uh, fluctuation to go through the hypertensive phase, but I know how to manage. And at the end of the road, uh, which is really very, very uncommon if the valve fails, you can go for another. You can go for another valve, but uh, you can go for cycloablative procedures with its um, advantages of repeatability and availability of different techniques. And with that, I thank you very, very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Thank you for this uh, nice presentation. Allah <laughs> khaliki Ali. How are you, Ali? I'm happy that you are here. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, yeah. And Hassan, yeah. I'm happy that Hassan is here too. <laughs> but uh, why, why, do, why push uh, Dr. Mazen away from glaucoma? He's still some hairs I, on the head. I Let did. him go to the glaucoma. <laughs> <to the soul. laughs> I didn't, you know that I love him to the extent that I don't want to involve him so much in the glaucoma so that keep him with the smiling, uh, refractive people. <laughs> He's too young for that. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Hassan, how are you? Um, um, how are you? Mashallah, Dr. Ahmad, you kill the, the, the monster. Mashallah, Tabarakallah. Yeah. Mashallah. <laughs> Thank you so much. It is just my, pra really? I know that uh, it's quite easy to, uh, uh, to mention what's written in the books, but I just want to transfer what I'm really doing in practice, which is, uh, which could be uh, quite different. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, everyone is so much comfortable uh, by what he is doing. And we are all ready to improve, by the way, so that I know 
you and Ali and others are having different uh, opinions and different schools. That's why I'm happy that you are here. <laughs> yeah, also we are happy only to, le to really? learn from you, Dr. Ahmed, mashallah. <laughs> uh, like Dr. 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 Abayda and Dr. Basil so also joined. Uh, Dr. Dr. Ahmed, uh, if I have uh, many questions, always this have a problem. It said about the encapsulated. Are you trying for the needling? I think is. 100% will not work anything. If work for one week, two weeks after that failed. For that, I now when when have very dense encapsulation, I didn't decide to make any needling for uh, for any AGV. What you are opinion about that? Are you still trying to do that or not? Look, Dr. Ali, for my valves, I don't see my plates anymore. The first and last time I see my plates on the operating table because Afterwards, they are placed so posterior, I cannot needle them. There is no way of needling them. But this patient, which I have shown, is not mine. I just came with a, a periplate a tenon cyst. So that I thought I could help him with something. But in my practice, I don't. I don't even advise cutting the fibrous capsule because there are some reports on opening the conjunctiva, but creating a hole in the, uh, the periplate uh, and then suturing the conjunctiva. What will happen? That fibrosis will come back. So that actually, Dr. Ali, I don't, for myself, again, if we are just uh, transferring uh, kind of uh, knowledge and experience, I don't do any interventions in the uh, post-operative therapy unless there is something which, is, which needs management, like tube occluded by the iris, occluded by the vitreous, as we will see next week. But as in, in a straightforward case, I don't do anything. I just, I, I totally agree with you. I totally agree. Yeah, for that, as this many doctors said, this is for, uh, blip, uh, for blade needling, as for uh, trabeclectomy needling. Trabeclectomy needling, 100% is working very well. But yes. with AGV, is 100% will not working because I tried many, many times for many years on 100% failed later. For that now, if I decided to go to another CBC, another uh, AGV and another blade, blade, but 100% I will not go to needling. Uh, another question about uh, the tunnel. 100% covering the tube under the sclera is more cosmetic and so much more beautiful uh, after the surgery. Only one uh, point, when you find the, the stiffness for the tube, the direction, always this is control the, scler the sclera, control your direction inside the eye because you go through a thinner, uh, thinner uh, sclera when you go inside the eye. For that, I compare many of my patients, this is under the sclera on the patient, cover, uh, the tube covered with sclera or totoblast. I found this is the tube is the direction is more away from the cornea and can, can control the tube direction more than under the sclera. This is my opinion, my experience. What are your opinion about that? Well, Dr. Ali, يعني, just believe me that sometimes some of my patients having iris stuck into the tube. So that again, uh, when you insert, uh, uh, the, the, you know that the point of entry into the eye is not a point, it's a tunnel. Mm -hmm. So that when I go underneath a scleral flap, and then when it comes to the limbus, and then on the posterior boundary of the limbus, you penetrate. This is not a point. You will go through a tissue. And that tissue will control the direction of the tube. So that it, for me, it is very uncommon to have a tube that's going towards the cornea. On the contrary, that sometimes I find my tubes moving towards the iris and I adjust them slightly and deep. So that the advice here is that you just go parallel. Just You just make the eye, you know that you, yes, you, you adjust the position of the cornea and then you go parallel to uh, the eyes. I really don't know whether uh, to have it under a sclera flap or just on the sclera will make a difference. I really don't know. I didn't compare uh, that, but in my hands, I don't have a tube that's moving towards the corner. Yeah, I have, I, have, I have one comment. Uh, Dr. Ali, Salaam Alaikum. How are you doing? Yeah, I have one point here. It's very important. It's very important tip here while entering the anterior chamber to go slightly towards the iris. Once you go slightly towards the iris, the tube 
when inserted the tube, it will be parallel with the iris. So very important tip while you are entering the anterior chamber. Yeah, because don't go, don't, don't go directly with with with, with uh, in, in the midway of the anterior chamber and don't go with the uh, parallel uh, plane of the iris. When you go just slightly to en enter the anterior chamber uh, towards the iris, without damage the iris. When you insert the tube, it will uh, go slightly up uh, by the secular flap or by the secular tunnel. Yeah, yes, over. yes, yes. And you have right. The most important, point. you know, you need to make just the tube beveled because exactly. if you are, you know, need to that can occur so that it's uh, beveled. And also you need to, uh, uh, in my hands, I need to inflate this area with here at the time of uh, insertion. I don't want to insert a tube in an anterior chamber that's shallow. I will not be able to judge the direction of the tube. Uh, I would love to have it uh, implanted in, inside the hearing. Ali, please. Uh, you, Salaam alaikum. You, uh, alaikum as Salaam, Dr. Bas. Salaam, Dr. Bas. Salaam alaikum. Uh, Dr. Alaykum Ahmed, thank you very much uh, for this informative uh, lecture and presentation. We learned a lot of uh, from you as always. I uh, will agree with you about uh, the uh, uh, anterior flap. Uh, uh, it is helpful indeed. And uh, my old practice in Ahmed valve implantation uh, to create a, a scleral flap uh, exactly as in traps and to insert the tube in the, uh, in the anterior chamber, then to put a scleral graft patch three millimeter away from the limbus to prevent any delay for the cornea in the in future. And uh, recently uh, I learned from you how to create this uh, three or four flaps and to uh, uh, put uh, or to insert the tube tunnels, uh, the tunnels. Totally, uh, yes, uh, yes, inside these uh, tunnels. Uh, for the direction of the tube inside the anterior chamber, what I'm doing usually, uh, I'm uh, taking a flap half thickness of the cornea, uh, of the sclera. I, I'm talking about the uh, anterior uh, flap and uh, when I am inserting or uh, creating a tunnel with a 27 uh, gauge needle or 26 gauge needle, I'm not going directly to the anterior chamber. I take it a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left. That will give me longer path inside the tissue. This will give me more control uh, uh, to the direction of the tube inside the anterior chamber. I think this uh, point will help us to uh, 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 overcome uh, the misdirection of the uh, uh, tube uh, forward the, uh, the cornea. Uh, by making the insertion of the needle during creating the tunnel a little bit uh, tilted to the right or a little bit tilted to the left. This will give us uh, extra tissue to Key to, uh, to keep the uh, uh, tube in uh, direction away from the cornea. You mean, you mean uh, oblique, oblique entrance into the exactly. chamber? Exactly. You, you know, Dr. Basel, sometimes you have patients with insufficient iris tissue and you need to have the tube uh, resting on the iris. And then you are obliged to move the tube uh, in an oblique direction to have the tube uh, on the eyes. Yeah, thank you very much for this. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Basil. Yeah, thank you. I think also the sclerotic thickness, the sclerotic flap thickness, is very important. In um, and when you when you have a very good uh, thick uh, sclerotic flap, uh, when you have a thick sclerotic flap, is better in adjusting the direction of the tube than you have. Uh, uh, a thin uh, sclera flap. Yes, I totally agree with you. This is different from a deep sclerectomy because of the deep sclerectomy, I opt for a thin flap, but uh, I, the mindset that while doing the valve, I, do, I go for a thick flap, unless there are some obstacle like uh, the sclera is thinned or um, we will see, I think next week, a lot of uh, horrible cases that uh, allow us to go out uh, of the menu <laughs> and then to think, and also, you, Dr. Ahmed mentioned for all, but I think uh, we didn't still have any experience with bowel uh, glaucoma implant, PGA. 
Yes. Are you try that or still? Because no, if, no. It, if it will work, it will be very, very good because the tube is uh, almost uh, half, half uh, of the Ahmed glaucoma and bear belt and will be very good to be more uh, away from the iris and from the cornea. I hope that. Yeah, 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 definitely. But you know that uh, Ahmed and Barbelt will not uh, give enough room for it to spread. They will uh, invent <laughs> more advantages. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ahmed, my colleagues, uh, if uh, you can accept my notice about the recent uh, eye watch uh, uh, drainage system. Indeed, uh, the, the, uh, the tube or the puzzle of the uh, uh, the watch is rigid. It's not uh, uh, as uh, in Ahmed valve or uh, in uh, Pervolt. Uh, so it's, uh, you will not be uh, worried about the direction of the uh, tube in this case, because it's rigid indeed, and it will be parallel to the iris. Interesting. That's an interesting. We don't have it actually in uh, Egypt yet, so that uh, there is no experience. Now, do you think uh, the glaucoma implants are for general ophthalmologists or for uh, glaucoma specialists? I can't if, if not for general specialists or let for me, general let me ophthalmologists. Yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I I always uh, I'm I'm very strict about subspeciality. I always. Uh, say that it is not only the technique, the surgery. If it is only the technique or the surgery, some technicians are better than many surgeons in doing surgeries. But the issue is how to uh, follow up the patient and how to manage a complication. It is very similar to refractive surgery. It is not that like I put my uh, 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 foot on the pedal and uh, push it and then the laser machine will do the job. It is how to study the patient, when to, how to put the indication, how to avoid complication, how to manage complication if they occur. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, saying that uh, valves or MIGs or microsurgery is underestimating the uh, such procedures. They give an impression that they are very easy and anyone can do it. While I think the the more microsurgery, the more delicate, and the, the more it needs experience, uh, especially how to manage if something uh, went wrong. So I usually refer the cases of such, uh, I treat medically for glaucoma to some extent, then when I feel that it is the time for intervention, I refer the patient to glaucoma specialist. Uh, specialist. So this is Thank my so much. my opinion, yes, yes. and I, I'm always like this. For <laughs> I don't allow I, any yes, any yes. Uh, general ophthalmologist to say uh, uh, something else. <laughs> and I actually ask this specifically for you because the, you are the only one who is not a glaucoma specialist. So that I ask this question just to allow you to contribute. <laughs> so I do <laughs> definitely we totally agree. So Ahmed, after this experience, sometimes you open the. <laughs> open the eye, especially for young patient, and you did, can, uh, cannot decide the result. Yeah, the young patient, myopic patient, on congenital glaucoma. Yes. You open the eye and you feel yourself that you open uh, for operation for the first time. You didn't know where is the sclerospore, where is the ciliary body, and you see this is as uh, uh, this uh, disoriented in this operation. This is the problem with the glaucoma. This is sometimes you feel this is your experience stopped on this patient on not working. For that is different from uh, even for refractive surgery. Dr. Mazen, mashallah, we we did a very big amount of refractive surgery with him on uh, Syria. But mm. even this is with the refractive surgery, you learn how you make the surgery. The machine help you. But after that, you have good experience. Unfortunately, any glaucoma, even with this experience, sometimes you find yourself is known, no any experience in some cases. You know, you know a big difference between the glaucoma specialist and, and, and other specialties that uh, you are having a kind of long-term uh, relation with your patient. I'm not, this is exist. I don't know that this is so much existing with refractive surgery because with refractive surgery, you tell the patient, if you have any problem, just come back 
but don't you don't have to follow for anything but for glaucoma you're having a kind of uh, relations and then you appreciate the the value of this relation with time and some patients are so much linked to the life by this relation and then they are having like one eye and advanced damage whatever the age is whatever the age is and they just want to know that they are fine no one else can convey this message that you are fine unless a glaucoma specialist. Because if you are an other specialty, I think you cannot say that from the bottom of your heart that you are doing fine. So that I think that the glaucoma specialists, they do something else, which is a kind of deep uh, relation with the patients, which is really very helpful for, it's very helpful for the, for the, the glaucoma specialist as well, but it's of great advantage for the patient. For that, I, I heard, uh, sorry. I, uh, sorry for interruption. I heard that from uh, Professor Tariq Sharawi that glaucoma specialist marries his patients. No, this is the, what I want, Dr. Mazin. That's our uh, teacher, Dr. Joseph Fatouh. We know this is uh, Dr. Mazin and all uh, Dr. Hassan, Dr. Basel. This our teacher in Syria said this is a glaucoma patient is a partner in your clinic. In your for clinic. that, it's better to choose <laughs> your partner. <laughs> Dr. Ahmed, uh, yes. I have I have I have one one point about the uh, 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 non-absorbable uh, suture and fixating the plate with non-absorbable suture. Actually, uh, I use absorbable suture, Vicryl seven uh, O uh, Vicryl, in all of my cases. But and you now more than 12 years, I'm working with Ahmed Bal, but I don't have any migration. Uh, I think here, uh, you, you know, the first, uh, the first uh, point is about the encapsulation around the blade, the fibrous capsule around. I think it, 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 uh, it is uh, responsible about uh, uh, preventing the migration of the plate anteriorly or posteriorly when, uh, when you have a, a good fibrous uh, capsule formation. And uh, you know that the vicryl suture take about uh, four to six weeks to, to uh, absorb. And, and uh, it's the same uh, time for encapsulation around the plate. This is what I'm uh, using in my practice. I know you are doing that and it should be perfect at that. I know there are different schools. But the recommendation, I think, is to use uh, non-absorbable sutures because um, I have seen eyes where the valve is uh, posterior, but on moving the eye, the tube moves inside the eye. So that, mm -hmm. so that the presence of the periplate fibrosis does not prevent the movement of the tube uh, inside the eye. And we have the opportunity to present this next week. So the tube can touch the cornea, can be all the time moving inside the eye. So that the recommendation is to go for uh, an unabsorbable. You, you definitely have a, a good ex experience that you need to publish uh, on that. And I have seen uh, some colleagues are putting the clear path even without sutures. But uh, you know that I have seen patients uh, who come with, uh, with valves that's just coming onto the cornea when I explored you no know, sutures. So that I know that also, they, they, could be, they could be successful yeah, uh, and, in some cases, but uh, complications uh, could happen. And also, one point is uh, one important point in uh, while you are using the tunnel technique, three tunnels technique. I think also, and this is tunnels will prevent migration as you you make twelve millimeter away from the uh, the limbus, and you create uh, three tunnels. And the the, the uh, posterior tunnel will prevent migration anteriorly as the plate will be secured by the uh, secural tunnel. Yes. Do you agree? Dr. Hassan, yeah, I, look, I, I totally agree. But the point is the, the posterior uh, tunnel will prevent anterior migration, but it will, it will not prevent posterior migration. Because mm. I still believe that the valve, when you put it, when you dissect everything nicely, and then you put the valve, the valve could slip posterior if there is enough mm. space, so that the sutures will prevent the posterior uh, slippage of the tube of the valve. Another, yeah, another important point also while creating the secleral tunnels. I, I, I did this technique. I learned from you. 
I did some modification without creating a lab. I did three <laughs> Must... channels, go Good. directly to cancer chamber. But I, I, I found that when you uh, make a narrow tunnel, narrow tunnel, it will be uh, yeah, uh, much better than wide tunnel. Narrow, narrow entrance, it's like just, just you can uh, insert the, the tube through the tunnel that will prevent the horizontal movement of the uh, uh, tube. And that will, I think uh, it will be better for the uh, erosion uh, by, by the time to be less erosion when you decrease the horizontal movement of the uh, tube while you uh, make narrow tunnels. I, uh, I don't know if it, do you agree about this point or not. So you have the mind of an engineer. <laughs> you have the mind of, <laughs> of an engineer. No, Look, yes, the, always, you know, that always we are having, we question what we are doing. That, that, that's very normal. And that's uh, the secrets uh, behind the improvements. So that when you do other, but when you do first tunnel and second tunnel, so that you can think of the articulation of the whole tunnels, how they interact with each other. It is not just a single tunnel. So that uh, the three tunnels, uh, how they will interact, especially if we will have a fixed entry of the tube. You, a lot of geometry at uh, this point, which I really, uh, beyond uh, my, uh, my brain to imagine and calculate, but definitely you are questioning everything, which is, which is the, the, the nature behind any improvement here. Yeah, thank you, Hassan. Dr. Ahmed, uh, as Dr. Engineer, Abayda, this is not agree. Uh, sorry, Dr. Abayda, but only with this Dr. as engineer, yeah. we not agree with this point only, because it's so much uh, tunnel, it's difficult to take the tube one point. And second point, this is the curve, the, uh, the sclera, more over the tube. And uh, for that, this is the same technique, but I make one tunnel from anterior to posterior from, from long time. Uh, I make, and this is only the 1.5 uh, 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 for the crescent, on go posteriorly. If this is the tunnel, is you didn't need so much wide and you didn't so much uh, cross because you need the the over the tube the sclera to go uh, smoothly to the side. If you mark so, so small, this is the sclera cover directly over the tube and may make uh, the tube is more prominent uh, under the sclera. And this in this type we will more risk for exposure. If you have more smoothly, that's the risk for exposure, I think, is will be less. Uh, sorry, yeah. Dr. Abayi. Yeah, please, yeah, Dr. Dr. Abayi. Dr. Ali, I, I mean uh, three tunnels, not Hassan. one tunnel. Dr. Hassan, let's say Dr. Abayda. He, is, he has yeah. raised his hand since one hour. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Abayda. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All, all panelists, to be honest, it's a pleasure uh, joining you here. Uh, you know, I, it seems like the uh, all of the nuggets from the talk are being discussed here. Bisarah, and it's it's beautiful to hear this discussion because you've got a cumulative experience of uh, you know decades, mashallah, yani, uh, here about aqueous shunt surgery. I just wanted to make a few uh, points uh, for discussion. Uh, obviously, uh, right at the beginning, we discussed um, needling for tube shunts. I completely agree with you, Professor uh, uh, Ahmed, that, you know, if the way in which the capsule forms around the aqueous shunts, around even micro shunts and pressure flows, I put nearly 300 pressure flow micro shunts in now, um, is, is quite similar to each other, actually. You, you get, you get a, an encapsulation which is very different to the uh, the sort of the healing that you get around trabeculectomy blibs. So definitely, if I start to see that a aqueous shunt is starting to fail and they're heading towards three, four drops, and I'm still at suboptimal intraocular pressure, I primarily use barvel tubes. I put in a few poles, uh, poles tubes as well, but my, my go-to is barvelt because I usually have a little bit more, more control at the moment and I have a lot more experience with barvelts. Um, I usually go for revision. It wouldn't be towards a needling. And in pseudophagic eyes, one of the great tools that I also use is Vision Blue. So intracameral Vision Blue, you use, I use quite well. It highlights to you if there is flow, where there is flow, of course, in the absence of, of any incarceration of the iris at the, uh, at, the, uh, at the entry into the anterior chamber. 
So that's the first point I wanted to make. The second point uh, I wanted to make is uh, the pause tube, I think, is something that's really, really going to be interesting because um, risk of hypotony is going to be reduced significantly. One of the biggest problems that we have with uh, the pressure flow works. It's 70 microns. It works. Um, but it doesn't work in everybody, um, especially in a black Afro-Caribbean young patients with multiple copathology. It doesn't work. They encapsulate early, they scar early, and they end up failing. Um, and I end up putting a, a, a bar belt or a poles in them. And the presence of a, of a plate creates a little pool for for the capsule to form a little reservoir of aqueous to drain in the subconjunctival space. Um, and I think in those patients, it's a good fallback to have on. I've uh, had a few pressure flows fail now that I've actually put bar velts in. And uh, in bar velts, uh, similar to clear path, you, um, you have the problem of early control. So uh, in these patients, I put in the intraluminal 3.0 proline, previously supramid, and bury it in the inferior fornix with the addition of two ligating sutures uh, and a, a distal, pro, uh, a distal vicral, uh, a proximal uh, vicral and a distal uh, proline, atoproline or 7-oproline. Um, and this usually uh, works quite well. But I've actually, I put my pressure flow similar to you, Professor uh, Mustafa, any tubes in the eye, I tend to keep them as posterior as possible whether they're phacic or pseudophacic, um, because I don't want the headache of having to refer to the corneal surgeons as accommodating as they are, Professor Sinjab, um, uh, in, in doing DMEX and DSEX. Um, but, uh, but I've tended to keep the pressure flow in. I haven't put Sherwood slits in, and it achieves the early control for, the, for early six to eight weeks. Um, uh, after revising the pressure flow, the, the, the subconjunctival space is a little bit deranged, but it's not as deranged as you would expect, for example, in a tube revision or a trabeculectomy revision. So those are the points I wanted to make. The pulse tube is very, very interesting. It's only 127 microns in the, inside the lumen. And one of the newest techniques that I've seen, I haven't done this yet myself in my practice, is actually uh, instead of like we would do with a bar belt, for example, and put an intraluminal, intraluminal supramid or, or 3 proline and put it all the way down into the inferior fornix under lateral rectus, we would uh, just do it as we would do a releasable in a trabeculectomy because you're only putting an 8 proline inside. And much like a, a releasable in trabeculectomy, you keep a short end that you take out and you pull through at six to eight weeks. So this is really quite interesting, you know, they not needing to take the patient back to the theater. Obviously the risk of hypotony in these patients is much less compared to Barvel's. Uh, and that's what I wanted to say really. It's, it's been fascinating to hear. Oh, the last thing, sorry, I wanted to say was in my practice, I tend to do a tutoplast, pericardial tutoplast to prevent uh, uh, extrusion of the tube. And as, as uh, Dr. Ali Sheikh has said, it is at the kink where you tend to get, the, in my experience, where you tend to get the uh, uh, where, where you tend to get the extrusions and the exposures uh, and it's where you entry. And although the dragon technique that, that Professor Mustafa uh, has described and his multiple dragon techniques sort of, or I mean going in and out, in and out, uh, um, it does reduce the risk of that. The tutoplast is also a good alternative for those who find it uh, maybe, maybe in your hands, Professor Mustafa, it's quick to do that, but you know, fashioning a partial thickness scleral flap may take a little bit longer than tutoplast if you glue it down. And also I was wondering about uh, your refractive considerations when doing this. Do you think it reduces the, uh, the mechanical integrity of the sclera uh, in your experience by sort of tenting the globe in a more, in a more vertical fashion and hence causing sort of a, with, the, uh, with the rule uh, astigmatism? Uh, those are the kind of things that I'll buy the I'll buy the I have the yes I think that unfortunately most of our patients are having a kind of advanced uh, glaucoma and then some refractive considerations they come you know at the end of the list so that with uh, one eyed advanced damage yes they could get some astigmatism but this is not uh, the problem 
But I have some questions for you. Thank you very much for your nice contributions. Actually, I'm happy that you are doing uh, Barvard because that, that's the other uh, arm of uh, the story. That's the other side of the coin. But I just want to ask you, why do you think the new medical world have introduced the clear path to the market? Because it's a kind of, um, are, they, are, are they mimicking the Barvard? And uh, are there obvious advantages of the, um, the, the, uh, the obvious advantages of the clear path uh, to uh, Barbell because clear path is not as small as we imagine. It's 250 and 350 square millimeters, still a big one, but might be amputated. The posterior part is a kind of the different shape. But again, um, my first question was that why do you think they have introduced the non valve uh, implants uh, to the market and they are uh, there a kind of comp or, they, or they want to have all the all the the, the, the items in the menu whether valve or uh, non valve this is one question the second question that you mentioned the pressure flow um, many times but do you think the pressure flow in the same category like the glaucoma drainage implants or it's a kind of that could it's done as a primary procedure and what we are talking about they come next so that are they in the same, uh, you know, that the same bag or same basket? Or... Fantastic. Uh, two very pertinent questions. Uh, I'll answer your second one first. Uh, in uh, in my treatment ladder, Sulum uh, al I tend to uh, leave my tube shunts right towards the end because um, uh, I know. I know that a pressure flow won't work in everyone. I know it works well in 70 year old white ladies. I know it works well in, uh, in, in patients who are old and Afro-Caribbean, but young pro-fibrotic uh, patients with a high uh, VEGF drive, even if I give them intraoperative ILEA uh, or even ILEA a week before, they still have very, very vascular angry, angry blebs. And I tend to inject these blebs with 5-FU even at one, week one and week three. Um, despite that, you'll find they may work for a period of four to six months, but then you're just adding up medication and then they fail. So patient selection, much like our earlier discussion about refractive surgery, I think is so imperative in pressure flow. Um, it, as I said, patient selection is really, really important. And only in patients, say, for example, I have a rubiotic uh, coming in that is, that, that is regressing. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, they've still, got, they've still got blood vessels. I would not put a pressor flow in. I did about seven rubiotics uh, with pressor flows uh, during the time of COVID when we weren't really seeing patients and the, and the diabetic retinopathy screening program was going down. And so we were seeing a lot of rubiotics at that time. We're going to be publishing a paper soon about the trends in rubiotic glaucoma. Um, and, um, and what I found is that, yes, we were buying time by putting pressure flows in, but most of these, yes, some of them have worked on their, their on treatment with a, with a pressure within target. But had we reversed time and put in, and, and put in a, a proper Barvel, barvel tube, we would probably not need to take them into theater again or do a diode uh, or, or, or do a, you know, a, a, a specific protocol diode for these patients. Um, as you know, in the UK, we've stopped doing micropulse for, for nice purposes um, uh, from a nice perspective. So pressure flow has its place, but I still always said, I mentioned in, in the talk a couple of days ago uh, that uh, trabeculectomy at remains the gold standard in patients who do not have a uh, strong angio pro-angiogenic drive. And tube shunts are the ones that I would use in patients who have failed trabeculectomies, rubiotics. Uh, interestingly, uveotics, pressor flow works beautifully in uveotics, the most beautiful blebs you will see, particularly with uh, a concomitant ilea or avastin or whatever anti vegf you like. The, the, it works beautifully. And I give uh, subconch kef, kefiroxime and dexamethasone in all of these patients, trabs, tubes, and pressor flows, any subconch surgery. Um, uh, the second part of your question, I hope that answers your first question. The second part of your question is why is New World Medical coming up with a clear path? Well, uh, 
I think that the Western barbell, the, the barbell market is largely dominated by the West in the Middle East and the EMEA region, the, uh, the Middle East and Northern Africa region is largely dominated by Ahmed Glaucoma valve. And a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, key opinion leaders like yourselves would, will stand up and say, oh, the bar belt uh, is fantastic. You have uh, good control. It achieves lower pressures in the long run. Uh, uh, you know, you but you have more control by doing argon suture lysis. You have lower, uh, you know, you uh, mm. you can remove the supramid, and uh, at some point, so you have more control over over the pressure that you're going to achieve. And New World Medical does not have does not have an answer to that. They've just got the amid glaucoma valve, so that's a target market. So from a corporate perspective, I think they 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 have try to put something on the table that is uh, competitive. The second reason as well, the clear path is smaller than the bar belt. It's much more, uh, it's much smaller and actually easier to use. No slinging muscles, none of this business at all. So that's their selling point. Every device that goes in, as you, you, you know, takes millions and millions in order to have in terms of research and development. And so they're trying to justify a new device that's a little bit better one contains a valve and one doesn't. So they try and take over the entire market because not many, not many people in the Middle East, to my understanding, put bar belts in or poles. It's yeah. all dominate, dominated by AGVs and the clear path, it seems, uh, in more recent times. Hope that answers yeah, yeah, the question. And, 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 and it's perfect. And you know, also there is no valve mechanism, so it's thinner. So the clear path is definitely, uh, though the surface area might be larger it's, than the Ahmed glaucoma valve, glaucoma 180 something, but... But it is no valve. It's uh, just more you can manipulate easily. Thank you, Obaida. Thank you for the contribution. Uh, and the last thing uh, I wanted to say, the last thing I wanted to say is it must be three years since I uh, I've put in two eye watches uh, and I don't really and I've managed them post operatively as well. Um, I don't really see myself, I don't see much added value in the iWatch. It's a very bulky, big device. Uh, their argument is it has a role in patients who are very, very much at risk of, of post-operative hypotony, young myopic patients, as we discussed earlier, uh, who've got very, very thin sclera, who, who will, will become hypotenus in conventional tube surgery. My humble opinion is I, is is that I don't think the principle of it works because the 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 uh, restrict the restriction is not at the lumen. The, your restriction is forming the capsule number one. Once the capsule is formed, yes, you can have control by removing the intraluminal suture gradually, partially, or, or or whatever it is. But I don't think dialing it with the magnet is the answer. And sometimes the magnet does get stuck as well. So it's not uh, it's not the answer to to everything. And it's not, it, in principle, it sounds amazing. You have a little magnet. You don't need to go do argon. You don't need to remove sutures. Completely aseptic technique. So on paper, it's a nice engineering uh, mechanism, novel way to come up with. But in practice, it's actually the surgery takes much, much longer, probably around two and a half to three hours, um, even in the slickest of hands. Uh, so that's, you could probably do around two, two bar belts easily uh, in that time, if not more in, in your very expert hands. So in, in, in my humble opinion, I think it's a bit of an expensive device uh, that has very, very limited role in, uh, in at least in my practice. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And it's considered as what makes the mix. No, 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 what, no. What no, is so the, the classification? Watch, I, I was. So I watch uh, it, what, what, the pressure flow is. The, the pressure flow, flow mix, would, yeah. The pressure flow, I would say, they, they call it a micro shunt uh, from a uh, selling perspective, purely because the smallest shunt available is 127 microns, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. the pulse tube, and the bar volts are running around 300, similar to the Ahmed. But the, the, the 70 microns in the press of flow, yes, but you still are doing it ab external. So you're still, a, yeah. you're still doing a peritomy from the outside. So they try to sell it as a mix, um, but in actual fact, I would call it a supra mix where it's like mix plus, it's not quite full trabeculectomy surgery. It takes me 20 minutes, 25 minutes at most if I'm having to put an extra two conjunctival sutures. Um, but I, it works. It works fantastic. When when pressure flow works, it's an absolute dream. Uh, no matter, regardless of what the preoperative intraocular pressure is, 
you will expect at day one, your pressure will be between five to seven. And at two months, your pressure will be 12 to 14. And it stays that's like interesting. that. That's interesting. That, that's interesting. And I think it's an, it should be compared to Zen uh, gel implant, for example. They are more or less of a kind of, um, in, this, in this area, or they are all together. And we can think which is more superior in some cases, like the uveitic glaucomas, you really surprised me by that because uveitic glaucomas, they tend to uh, respond beautifully to different surgeries, like the valves, they respond to angle surgery, they respond, hemigat, they respond, something that, something very strange. And sometimes they do not respond immediately, but after a while, uh, you get a perfect response. So those eyes, they need, uh, you know, a, a bit of uh, more focus. They respond beautifully to most of the surgical procedures. Yes. Thank you for so much for letting me uh, letting me contribute yeah, amongst. No, you no, no, so no, no, no. That, that was that was very nice, really. That was very nice. Jazakum uh, khairan Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, it was a very interesting session. Uh, so, uh, I think. Uh, we have only two questions to go through. Um, uh, the first one, uh, do you do tube flushing if the IOP elevated, Dr. Ahmed? So that um, I think uh, tube flushing uh, is not an easy procedure. You need to go uh, into the OR. It's not a slit lamp uh, procedure and then you have to have a good control of the intraocular uh, management. And then if you are going to push fl uh, fluid and then just think and, uh, and what? And then what if you're going to push fluid? It looks like massage so that you can replace this with a kind of digital massage. You don't have to flush. I did it once and uh, I actually didn't find any response, uh, but the pressure was really high so that uh, it doesn't do anything uh, additionally or not injecting like anti metabolite the digital massage, I think, will do the work. And at the, at the end of the day, it's it's not an easy uh, procedure to flush. Unless you are having like high FEMA, you need to give uh, tissue plasminogen activator, something something to the story, but just to flush fluid, no, I don't, I really, I don't advise. Can uh, I the, make uh, one, one yes. Dr. Mazen? Only yes, just sir. tube flushing, if this is, you have a very drawback that's uh, the blade uh, posteriorly on the tube is go outside the eye. Can you open the tube only uh, anteriorly? And can you try with the flushing? This is the benefit of the flushing. If you make the flushing on find very good uh, out of flow, and this, can you make this is a tube extender? You didn't need to remove the, the blade on the um, uh, all the blade, only cut the tube on uh, both the tube extender inside the eye or the modification that were uh, presented from Dr. Ahmed also with, as a small sleeve or the tube extender from the company. In this case, uh, the tube flushing is good not to remove all the blood and make a new operation. Sometimes you find the blade is working very well behind only the pressure is go up because the blade go posteriorly on the tube, go from uh, from the eye on the closed with the sclera. This is the benefit that's, from- uh, that's, why, that's why we apply uh, non-absorbable sutures. So that the plate does- I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Now the other question is, what about Paul glaucoma valve? I think you have mentioned this. Uh, Bolt's valve, yeah. you have mentioned uh, Ali and Obaida. Yeah. I've talked about this. I guess. All right. So that's it. And uh, thank you very much for uh, Professor Ahmed Mustafa for the very fruitful and uh, full of science uh, presentation as usual. Uh, I, I, I love your way and presentation because it's very simple and direct to the point. Uh, very easy to understand even for uh, non-glucoma spe uh, specialist and uh, thanks for all the panelists who uh, uh, very very uh, kindly contributed to the very nice discussion and added a lot and thanks for uh, all the audience who uh, stayed with us and uh, see you next week inshallah same time Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh uh, Dr. Wow. Mazen before you come just next week uh, yeah. bring some yeah. uh, challenging cases we will have mm -hmm. different opinions, I think, so that we can have different points of view. 
mm. please uh, come and yeah. I'll try my best to bring uh, interesting cases, inshallah. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Inshallah. So there will be a battle. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bye bye.